Speaking of history, I'll do two minute spiel here because a lot of places I go to speak, they ask, what is, what is a colonel, an army colonel doing as the supervisor of New York Harbor and talking about resiliency projects on the coast of New Jersey and the Long Island, uh, Long I, I got that wrong, the coast of Long Island and the New Jersey shore. So part of that goes back to our history. And in 1775, George Washington was looking for engineers to try to um, help with the defense of the country in that time. And we were really dependent on engineers from France and Poland and all places that did not like the British. So because of that, um, we, uh, we gathered up the best skills that we could, and most of the people that came to the United States were farmers and for other reasons. So, so we developed the defenses of New York City in 1776. And as you, as you may, anybody that's a revolutionary history buff knows that the British staged in Staten Island. They sailed across New York Harbor and landed in Brooklyn and went up Brooklyn and then took Manhattan and held Manhattan for the duration of the uh, Revolutionary War. So after the war was over, George Washington re recognized that we didn't have enough engineers that were being homegrown in the United States. And he established the United States Military Academy in 1802, and at the same time with a Corps of Engineers uh, to develop with the sole purpose of developing the technical expertise necessary to provide for the fortifications and defenses of the nation, and particularly New York Harbor. So that was done. and. Um, so the only technical engineers and the only engineering school in the nation at that point was, uh, was West Point at um, the United States Military Academy. So all the engineers were coming out of West Point and they were in the Army. Uh, since that time, and I'll skip to the future, well, it, well during that time, as, we d as our nation developed and our waterways became important for navigation and trade and commerce, the Corps of Engineers was responsible for uh, maintaining those, those important economic uh, functions and doing those things, and, and we've just retained it the entire time. So we're still here today. The Corps of Engineers back in 1800s was about 99% uh, military and about 1% civilian. And today, after the uh, evolution of our incredible uh, university system and the engineering and architecture schools that have developed since then, our, the Corps of Engineers is now 99% civilian and 1% military. So I stand before you as the commander of the New York District for the Army Corps of Engineers. And um, our responsibilities, as, as was stated, um, go to basically the Long Island coast, uh, the northeastern shoreline of New Jersey, and then the Hudson River as it goes up to Canada. So let's see. I don't think, oh, there it goes. All right. So it, in the New York District, we do lots of different things. We have civil works, which is, I think, what I'm going to talk about mostly today, which includes flood da damage risk reduction, both fluvial and coastal. And we do navigation projects, and that one of our big projects there is the harbor deepening project. We also do military construction and um, support for others. We have eight military posts, and a lot of um, federal agencies have overseas responsibilities in certain areas. And my, my partners at GSA and FEMA and EPA, they get to, uh, their overseas responsibilities are in uh, such balmy climates as uh, Puerto Rico. So New York District, we're a little more uh, uh, robust, austere than that. Our overseas responsibilities are in Greenland. So that's a <laughs> fun trip to go to Greenland once a year and figure out what's going on there. So um, we have a regulatory program. So if anything touches a navigable waterway or um, if it impinges upon the waters of the United States and wetlands, then you have to get a construction permit from the Corps of Engineers. Uh, we do environmental remediation and restoration, and we respond to emergencies and contingency operations. And I'll talk a little bit of, of that in my experiences after Hurricane um, Sandy. And um, okay, so I'll go to the next slide and just talk about Sandy a little bit. So we've seen this chart many times before. All of us are very familiar with this. And these are New York City statistics um, primarily. But as was mentioned earlier, the storm came up the coast, and it made this strange left turn. Most of the storms that come up the coast end up spinning off this way. But this, there was a large high pressure system right here that caused the storm to turn left and hit with the center of the storm was basically the eye of the storm was over Atlantic City. And if there's any uh, coastal or hurricane watchers out there, you know the worst place to be um, on the, for the hurricane is on the, the upper portion where the kind of the hard right hook is coming in to the city. So the eye comes in and the hard right hook would hit right into the New York bite in New York City and caused the most extensive damage. So the hurricane comes swirling in like this and then the, the right hook came right into New York bite. And then there was also damages certainly in New Jersey and south of uh, 
um, Atlantic City, but you're getting a different side of the storm and different effects. Two things that also happened at that time were the storm hit. Um, it came in at about, uh, I think it was about 10 p.m. on the 29th of October, and that coincided exactly with the high tides that were um, at the battery in, um, in the tip of Manhattan. So extreme high monthly neap tides, the highest tides of the entire month hit at exact same time where the storm surge from Sandy combined together to create a condition where um, we had seen record flood stages at the battery. Somebody had mentioned about nine hours later, if the storm had come in nine or ten hour, nine hours later or on a different tidal cycle, and we would have seen a whole a completely different set of results. You know, we saw flooding in lower Manhattan uh, and certainly flooding along the Rockaways and Staten Island and, and in New Jersey. Had it come in, I've heard the city talk about this a little bit in their planning team, had it come in about six or seven hours off cycle of what it had, they think the most of the damage would have happened in, um, in Long Island Sound and there would have been much more damage to this place called Hunts Point's distribution system which could have been a much greater catastrophe than what it was. Had that, that you know, food distribution system that is so critical to the uh, supplying uh, New York City uh, been damaged or destroyed, we could have had a lot worse crisis on our hands. So, okay. Um, this was, as measured at the battery in, uh, in the tip of Manhattan, the storm at, on Sandy in October 2012 was, it, we know at about 10 and a half feet or 11 feet, it starts flooding there at the tip of the battery. So when we started seeing storm surge predictions at 12 feet, we, we started taking preparations with the city. We worked very closely with the city and their preparedness and planning for hurricanes. And um, so we worked with them and the, the city took precautions to try to evacuate the area. And uh, some people listened, some people didn't. But one thing New York City did that really worked out well was they moved their uh, mass transportation, the subways, the buses, and things like that to high ground. They stopped. It takes about 12 hours to do that. Mayor Bloomberg took a lot of heat for making that decision, along with Governor Cuomo, for making that uh, decision to remove those um, assets. And who would have thought that the tunnels were going to flood, but the tunnels flooded. And you know, imagine the damage that would have been done and the recovery process, how complicated it would have been if you had subway tunnels filled with subway trains and uh, buses that were completely um, inundated in, in, in the floodlands. So, Again, the, the interesting thing about this chart is to look at the dates, too. And if you look at these high water marks, you see October 2012, 2011, 2010, 92, 99. And you know, in the last 50 years, these have um, all been increasing. So I think we all know that story. But clearly, the intensity and frequency with which storms are happening in the Northeast has got us uh, cause for um, concern as we look at our coastal infrastructure and our facilities. So some of the storm risk reduction measures we take are there's lots of different things to build and you can build uh, bulkheads on, in areas. Uh, we use groins to help hold the sand in place. We use deployable flood walls as emergency measures to stop you know, areas we know are vulnerable that have design gaps. We'll put up deployable flood walls before uh, a storm hits. And there's armored stone to prevent erosion. Uh, we have tide gates and we do levees. So, uh, but one of the biggest things we do, which uh, is a big part of our program right now, is sand placement. So sand placement comes in the form of dunes and berms. And I think I've been trying to share my thoughts on what a difference between a dune and a berm is, because some people don't, don't quite fully understand what that is. A berm is a place where you lay your, your towel on the beach. That's where you lay your towel on the beach. It has good recreational purposes. And a dune has uh, elevated height. It's typically much steeper than a berm. And uh, you typically walk over the, the uh, dune, and then you walk onto the berm. And uh, different beaches are designed different ways. There's a lot of thought that goes into what the threat is in the area. Berms typically prevent um, most damage from wave action. So the energy that comes in from the waves that hit the, sh hit the, the shore or the beach, they're absorbed by the uh, by the berm and it takes it so it, we, we put the sand there so that the, it's, there's more separation and there's more basically sand or beach to absorb that energy from the wave so it's not cresting and hitting against structures that are um, closer to the inland. Uh, the dune prevents uh, surge. So uh, the dune, as you can imagine, is a vertical uh, 
structure and it's designed as the surge builds up and there's a difference between energy from the waves and, the, and the, as the surge comes up so the dune provides that vertical height to uh, prevent the water from inundating the, the inland area. So this is an area in New Jersey, this is Long, Long Branch, New Jersey. Um, I believe that's Long Branch, New Jersey. But this shows our sand placement and some of the operations. We have two dredges working out here and there's a pipe that comes ashore and we pump the sand, we take the, the, the sand from an offshore site somewhere, we, one of these dredges, what they do is they pick it up in their hopper, uh, they bring it to this location, they hook up to the pipe, and the pipe pumps the sand onto the beaches, and you can see we've added, in this case, 70 feet of, uh, of berm from the, um, what was washed away from Sandy to here. To date, we've placed about uh, 9 million cubic yards of sand um, of about, 16 million is our plan for our current projects that we're doing right now, and I'll talk a little bit about the phases that those are there. But we're about halfway, a little more than halfway done with restoring our, our, uh, the projects that we already had in place to their design conditions. And that's, that's significantly different. Sandy took away about 8 million cubic yards worth of sand, and we're going to actually put back about 16 million cubic yards worth of sand. Um, and I'll talk about that a little more. So these are our, this is a, uh, um, a map of our projects, and we have different kinds of projects. The yellow areas are areas we call constructed projects. They were built prior to Superstorm Sandy hitting, and they were kind of in what I call a warranty period. So for up 50 years after a storm, if, if there's a storm, or after the project is completed, if there's a storm and there's damage, the federal government will come in at 100% cost and repair those, those projects to the pre-storm conditions. Now that's important to note that it's the pre-storm conditions. So normally what we'll do is we would restore the beaches to the pre-storm conditions. So on October 28th, 2012 is what our design parameters would be and we would put that amount of sand back on the beaches to restore them. Um, the public law 113-2, which was passed in January, actually authorizes us to restore the, the the constructed projects to their originally authorized design conditions. So in places like Rockaways and on the Jersey Shore and Kingsburg and places like that where the original design conditions go back to like 1974, uh, they, they're going to see more sand and more, a higher level of risk reduction than they've, they've had since, you know, 40 years ago. So that's significant. It costs a little more money and the, the uh, legislatures led by, you know, several influential New York congressmen and senators and New Jersey congressmen and senators made sure that that provision was put in there. Um, the second category is the red lines, which are authorized but unconstructed projects. So there's several areas where we had projects that were authorized but were never constructed because of certain things. Could have been available, availability of funding. It could have been the local sponsor decided not to do it. And probably our, my most famous example is Long Beach where we had an authorized and unconstructed project in Long Beach. Um, but in 2006, we were ready to go to construction, and the local community uh, backed off and said, Let's, we don't, we're not sure we want to do this. We're concerned about the damage to the recreational facilities and, uh, and some of the things and aspects that are going to be associated with that project. So we didn't build it. And um, you know, had it been built, I think you'd see a different story in uh, Long Beach today. So Long Beach community is much more energized and uh, ready to move forward with this project as we go forward. So we look forward to starting in Long Beach with our, this project we were supposed to do back in 2006 um, in the fall of this year. Um, so those are the author, there's kind of two categories of authorized but unconstructed. The first category is ones that we've actually started construction on or started design on, uh, and those are, are funded at 100% federal cost which is significant considering that uh, the Long Beach project is going to be one of those projects, it's 100 percent federal, and um, usually the cost share for our projects is about 65 percent federal, 35 percent um, local. And our local sponsors in New York are the uh, Department of Environmental Protection and in, in uh, excuse me, Department of Environmental Conservation in New York and in Dep Department of Environmental Protection in, in New Jersey. So the state and the cities come up with the, the 35 percent. Um, our project in Long Beach is, is going to cost over $100 million to construct, so that's not, that's not insignificant amount of money to raise for, either, for both the federal government and the local communities to come up with that. So um, if this is 100% federal, then the state doesn't have to come up with, um, with any of the shared funding. 
for that. So the, uh, the, 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 purple, the purple lines are uh, places where we're doing a reformulation study. And this is our Fire Island to Montauk Point project, which we've had on the books for a long time. We've been doing a lot of study on it. Um, and we need to go through what we call a general reevaluation to update our environmental documentation and our process and procedures to make sure that we're, we're complying with that. So this is a very interesting project and certainly of interest to a lot of people probably in this room. And um, it's a, this is probably our most expensive of all the projects. This is estimated on the order of about $700 million to, to construct. And some of it is sand placement, but other parts of it is um, home raisings. So we've talked about that with different communities. And a big part of the Fire Island to Montauk Point project is to raise the homes on the south shore of Long Island um, that are in the, 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 the flood zone at this point. So um, that's a significant part of the cost of that project. There's about 4,400 homes in, in, that are, we think are vulnerable in the areas uh, that would need to be either raised, and, and we can talk about that project some more if you'd like. But uh, OK. So the, the, the public law 113-2, which is the, the, the Disaster Recovery um, Act of 2013, had um, $50 billion worth of funding in it. Of, those, of that $50 billion, $5 billion came to the Corps of Engineers to, to do the work and do projects that were associated with, uh, with damage done from Hurricane Sandy. And of, those, of that $5 billion, the Meyer headquarters is North Atlantic Division, which goes basically from Virginia to the coast of Maine. About $3.25 billion, $3.25 billion um, came to uh, New York District or to our area, we were mostly impacted to do the projects. We've got 62 projects that are on our books that we're trying to either repair, restore, or construct new, study, and then build. And um, the federal funding, which is pretty unique and has relieved a lot of barriers for us to get things done, is fully authorized and appropriated. And um, usually that process alone takes several years to get done. So we're moving forward quickly. We've, we've the last year, we've been primarily working on our repair and restore projects. And we are, we're going to complete this by the fall of this year. We have several operations and maintenance projects, which are, and these were our initial estimates, and this is what we've actually spent, or what our new, our new estimate is, by the way. So our O&M projects, the Sandy came in and it dumped a lot of sand into the navigation channel, so we have to go back and dredge out the sand from the navigation channels to make those projects uh, fully functional for their, their navigation and purposes. So we have several authorized and ongoing projects, so we're going to start these. These took a little longer to get started, so these are all going to start. I think we started our, we're going to start our first one here pretty soon in New Jersey at Port Monmouth. And um, Coney Island is also an example of a place we're going to start one of those. And we have uh, new projects and studies, so that's the total. And if you put a dot on where all our different projects are by phase, you'll see it covers uh, pretty much the whole coastline. And we even have, it's interesting to note, the orange dots are the, the studies, the yellow dots are the, um, the repair and restore projects, and the red dots are the authorized projects that are, that are now constructed. Um, we have a lot of studies going on on the northern shore up here, so we, we hope to do some work not just on the south shore, but on the north shore of Long Island. Okay. So I, I thought I'd focus in on four different projects, and we can talk about some more, but I want to talk a little bit about what's going on at Coney Island from our perspective, uh, from the Rockaways in Jamaica Bay, Fire Island to Montauk Point, and the south shore of Staten Island, in no particular order. So... So Coney Island, this is um, taken from the special report on resiliency done by the city. Um, this shows you where Coney Island, um, the flood damage from th that they experienced. And it was pretty, we had an existing project at Coney Island right here. And you know, I talked to the owners of the Zuna, Luna Park and all the rides there. And actually, all the rides did not get inundated. They were not flooded. And that was the purpose of our beach project right here was to, it was a beach berm, it, the height was tied, is tied right into the boardwalk, if you've been on Coney Island before. And uh, the water did not get over this, uh, the beach berm and the boardwalk. The water came in from Coney Island through Coney Island Creek and flooded from the backside over here. So we've gone back since and replaced the sand that was lost due to Sandy, due to the erosional effects of Sandy, and uh, right here. 
And we're going to add some structures over here to help with this erosional effects that are happening because of our project over here. And, uh, but we're not going to solve this problem of Coney Island Creek right away. So there will still be an, uh, a problem with Coney Island Creek. So let me show you a little. This here is another picture of, our, of what an example of our project is. So Coney Island, this is our, we call it our flood control and coastal emergencies project. So we placed um, uh, 800,000 cubic yards of additional sand on the beach from the 37th Street groin up to this area here. Uh, but our project authorization does not include the area of Seagate. But you can see what's happened over time. We have this groin, and the sand has eroded from these beaches, and uh, it has collected over here. So we've created some problems with our project. And to help prevent that in the future, we're going to put uh, several T groins at this location right here that will protect and make sure that our sand and our project stays in this area. Anybody from Coney Island and familiar with uh, the Seagate community? So. Okay, good. So, well, the, the part of the reason you'll see this is Seagate is actually a private community. And um, so in order to authorize a federal project, you have to allow public access to the area. So the community of Seagate does not uh, have public access. So we are constructing a part of this project in that area, but the whole purpose is to protect our existing project in this area. So, but once again, we still have a problem with Coney Island Creek. and. You know, the city has come up with, that's what uh, the t grinds would eventually look like that. And, then, and they're designed to hold the sand on the beach and also to protect erosion from our project. So the city has a, a plan to do some interesting things. And, you know, this is not an authorized project, but it's how I think it's important to show that it's definitely more than just one part or one person doing different things to make sure that we have a community that's... Um, got significant level of risk reduction for future storms. So this is a uh, tide gate on Coney Island Creek, and the idea is that uh, they'd make these wetlands and do some things and some parks and some sacrificial areas that could be flooded, uh, but also create a tide gate here that would prevent this flooding that's coming in from the backside of Coney Island and flooded Nathan's Famous and flooded all the things that, uh, that we saw at Coney Island. So. That's part of the discussion there. If you look way off in the background, too, there's something interesting. So this is Rockaways. And there's another tide gate potentially right here. So that's something we can, we'll also discuss. So the city's looking at these ways to um, protect certain areas that um, were certainly the most vulnerable from Hurricane Sandy. So, OK. Speaking of Rockaways, and if you looked closely, that, that the graphical or the artist rendition of where that uh, tide gate would be, it's, it's somewhere between here and here, and maybe somewhere between here and here. So, but we have lots of things going on in Rockaways and Jamaica Bays, and that's one of our project authorizations and appropriations is there. So recently, we, we, co we combined two different projects. We had Jamaica Bay flood risk reduction projects, and we had the Rockaway Inlet in the project. So because this is basically one system, we combine these together. And this is going to be a huge effort over the next few years. We're going to look mostly at the storm risk reduction studies, so the things in yellow are going to be associated with our, uh, our ongoing project there. We do have a lot of ecosystem restoration um, and some some marshland restoration sites and things like that. And, you know, the, we're doing a comprehensive study right now to try to determine what the impacts of these nature-based features and how they helped with uh, reducing the, the, uh, the effects of Superstorm Sandy and Hurricane Sandy. But, uh, but we haven't, so we, we know there's value to that at this point. Um, we're still, in the past, we've always had a hard time just economically justifying nature-based features, uh, ecosystem restoration and things like that as opposed to, as it comes to the, the, the benefit-cost ratio to determine a federal interest in a project. And now we're trying to codify that a little more um, with our comprehensive study so that the, the economic benefits and the storm risk reduction benefits of a nature-based feature like a marshland or an ecosystem that's, that's restored uh, can be incorporated into our future studies. So that's a, a step forward in terms of uh, trying to do that. We're not there yet, uh, but with future projects, we hope to incorporate that. Um, in the past, it was often you either had an ecosystem restoration project or you had a, a flood risk reduction project. 
Um, and it had to be classified as one or the other, although now I think we see that there are mutual benefits to both of those types of projects. So this will be an ongoing effort, and um, our first efforts are going to happen out here in, in Rockaways, and we are repairing uh, the existing project we had out in Rockaways, um, and we are gonna, we're going to um, do more project, uh, some harder structures like groins to help uh, keep the sand in place are going to come eventually. A lot of people in the Rockaways are concerned about the erosion of the sand. They get concerned we put the sand on and then it erodes away too quickly, so that we will eventually put some groins out there that will hold the sand into place a little, little, for a little longer duration. Um, it, this is, it's always interesting challenges with every project and perhaps it's worth sharing. So Breezy Point is an area kind of like Seagate that's a private community. So we, we, we're not going to put any sand at Breezy Point at this point. We may be able to do that with the reformulation study. Um, and then we have Reese Park right here which uh, is, a, is part of the National Park Service and we have an agreement with the National Park Service that we don't put sand. The National Park Service prefers natural systems and um, we kind of taper our projects off into the National Park Service. But I think we are going to, uh, we're in negotiation and discussion right now with, with Reese Park and um, Gateway National Park to, to actually put some sand on the beach to help them with their stormers reduction. So. Um, Fire Island to Montauk Point, this is, you know, 83 miles from Fire Island Inlet out to Montauk uh, Point worth of areas and there are uh, different stretches along the way. I, don't, I won't bore you with the details, but we do have a lot of sand going on the beaches here, a lot, but most of our efforts are going to be focused on the South Shore with the, what we call a non-structural solution, which is to raise homes and to uh, uh, buy people out and and do things like that, so um, to protect against the areas that are mostly vulnerable. We are going to break out. This process is going to take a while to do the home. We're, we're probably we're several years away from doing the home, home raising and buying part of that. That's going to be a part of the uh, our reevaluation, because the vulnerability of the areas um, in the Fire Island communities, and then also in areas like Mastic Beach, where we had a significant breach. We had actually three breaches during Sandy of the Barrier Islands. We closed in two of them. One of them is still open. It's in Old Inlet in the uh, National Park Service area, the wilderness area there. And, uh, but in order to protect these areas a little bit better, we are going to proceed forward with our sand placement um, this fall. So around September of this year, we are going to start placing sand in Smith Point County Park and then some areas to protect the Fire Island communities um, sooner rather than later. And we tried to break that out. We have to do a full um, NEPA documentation and environmental impact statement for the entire stretch of the project. And that's going to take a couple of years to coordinate, get done, and be ready. Uh, had, we not, had we not broken out the parts for uh, Smith County State Park and the Fire Island communities, and there's another area in downtown Montauk we're going to break out, um, that would have uh, you know, basically been another two years before we had some level of uh, storm risk reduction in place. And so we've worked that closely with our federal partners and the local communities to make sure that that's uh, acceptable. This is, um, this is kind of a hard chart to read. When you first look at it, it looks kind of scary with all the red, but uh, this is, the white is actually the water, the, the gray is the barrier island, and then the, this other gray is the south shore. So. You can see the red areas are areas where all the, where the homes are, the non-structural part. And these are where all the homes are that would be impacted by um, by by floods, by the normal the hundred, the hundred year flood. So these are areas that are being considered for the buyouts. Buyouts would be voluntary, um, based on a homeowner's um, desire. So that or, or home raisings, and there'd be federal funds associated with that to do it. So you can see different. The project calls for different things. It calls for um, um, a, a berm in some areas and a dune in other areas and that's what uh, this is the yellow is for a, uh, a berm and the green is for a dune so you can see where we would put dunes and berms and things like that so we've been in close negotiations with uh, the communities and the state to make sure that uh, we do the, the most we can some of the gaps are areas where there are natural parks so we don't have a uh, project in the natural na national park area Okay. Just real quick on South Shore, Staten, Staten Island. You know, I th during Sandy, uh, Staten Island was probably hit the hardest when it comes to uh, 
fatalities. I understand there were 24 deaths on Staten Island um, from Sandy. I think the overall across the region, there were um, around 87 or so um, deaths. So 24 of those came in Staten Island. And those of you not familiar, I'm sure we could get a better explanation from those that live on Staten Island. But you know, the, the, the boulevard, um, Father Capadano Boulevard is a certain height and the surge came up over Father Capadano Boulevard and the water just rushed down into the low-lying areas where people live. Uh, and very unexpectedly, again, this was a historic surge. Um, and um, people were unable to get out of their homes in, in time for some, of the, for some of the things that were there. Lots of, um, lots of incredible community effort in Staten Island and, and in Rockaways and all over to help clean up. But I certainly saw firsthand in Staten Island people uh, responding incredibly resiliently and in trying to recover. So we do have, we didn't have a project in Staten Island. We had a study, an ongoing study at Staten Island. So, and our study consists of, it basically breaks down to two different parts. There's um, Fort Wadsworth to Oakwood, to Oakwood, and then there's Great Gills down to Tottenville. So we call the first part is phase one, and there's two very different, we break it up in that reason because there's two very, very different geographies of Staten Island. And that from Fort Wadsworth to Oakwood, we're doing a large uh, beach structure uh, to include hard uh, concrete reverments with sand over them tied into the, the park service and the boardwalks that are there. Uh, and that's our first phase, and we're going to start that. That study is going to complete hopefully in the next year, and then we'll have to work for an authorization to get a project. But, you know, it's sad to say that um, we are still a couple years away from being able to provide um, physical structures on the ground to help with Staten Island. So in the southern part from Great Kills to um, Tottenville is vulnerable in a different way, a lot of erosional effects there, but it's a little bit higher elevation, so it doesn't have the same kind of threat uh, from storm surge that, the ta that uh, Wat Fort Wadsworth to, to uh, Oakwood Beach has. So, but you can see the different things we're doing here. We have different sections with buried sea walls, with sheet pile walls, um, and um, earthen levees, and different things like that associated with. This is gonna be an expensive project also well over $300 million for the efforts on uh, Staten Island. Okay. So, you know, I guess when you look at this, there is a, we talked about the regional solution and there are, there are definitely gaps. Um, the one gap, the one big gap I see is, is up the Hudson River. So, um, that's one of the big gaps and um, there was certainly lots of damage done to the Hoboken area uh, Little Falls and the area in, um, in New Jersey, Jersey City, that in our, one of our facilities at Jersey City was flooded and um, ha we have to rebuild that one ourselves. So, but there is, there is a gap along the Hudson River in this area and that regional solution. The city has an, a very good detailed plan to deal with it. Um, New Jersey is working through that right now and you know, I think that the cities of, and that are on the the New Jersey side of the Hudson River across from Manhattan are, have, all, they have a lot of good individual plans on how to deal with it because that's really the only solution they have right now. There has been, you know, I, as one of this, the comprehensive study um, which will come out in January of 2015 for, for the public that the Corps of Engineers is doing, it's, it is focused, it's, well, it, it includes areas from Maine to, to Virginia, but it's going to be focused in the New York metropolitan area and the areas that were most significantly damaged by Sandy. And they're going to come up with some reconnaissance level areas to, um, to discuss and look at further. It's not going to necessarily be authorized projects, but they've already identified uh, two gaps with our help. So one of them is, that, is the Hudson River, and we think there's going to be an authorization for a further, further study um, to determine whether or not there's a federal interest in putting a project uh, that would protect basically lower Manhattan and New Jersey, um, the east side of, New, of, of the west side of New Jersey across from Manhattan in that area. So there has been, that, that's, that's one area. The other area is the Back Bay in Suffolk County. So our Fire Island project includes uh, Nassau, excuse me, excuse Suffolk County, but it does not include um, Nassau County. So we are looking at the Back Bay area also for further study in, uh, in uh, Nassau County. But when we go back to the harbor, New York Harbor, clearly um, huge amounts of damage to infrastructure and everything from the Passaic uh, Sewerage Commission, wastewater treatment plant, 
and uh, to the, 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 the financial district in, in downtown Manhattan and other areas, the tunnels that were flooded. Um, huge economic impact and there's a good benefit. You'd think there'd be a very positive benefit cost ratio that would identify a federal interest in a project that would protect that infrastructure. So there has been a lot of uh, unique theories and ideas floated out there about how to do that. One of them is do you, do you build a hundred little projects um, out, you know, in, to identify and to isolate particular areas or do you, do, do you build one big huge project that, that addresses that concern? So there are a couple ideas on big, huge projects that have been floated out there. One of them is a bridge underneath, or excuse me, a tide gate underneath the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. And uh, that's an interesting philosophy, although it would not protect Staten Island and it wouldn't protect Rockaways in the areas that are most severely damaged by uh, Sandy. So that, that project, you know, initial ballpark guesstimate order of $5 billion to $10 billion, and do you put all your eggs in that basket, that big project basket that might take 10 to 20 years to build, and then in the meantime have the cumulative effects of um, small, you know, uh, of, of no, no work on any local projects because, uh, because you're waiting for this big project to be built. And if it's not built, then you're still going to accumulate those damages over time as the storms come. The other big project is uh, a, a potential seven-mile tide gate from Rockaway to Sandy Hook. So that would be more comprehensive. It would definitely protect uh, Staten Island, not the Rockaways, but it would protect Staten Island and certainly all the infrastructure up the Hudson River. So there are, those are some just conceptual things that you know people are looking at. There's no plans at this point to do anything. I think the first step in doing something like that would be um, a, a New York Harbor, New York, New Jersey Harbor uh, flood risk reduction study from the federal government uh, with the involvement of local, local, uh, local and state officials from both states to try to figure out how to work that out. But there is clearly lacking at this point, in my opinion. We don't have a great regional solution to what's happening. We are rebuilding the projects that were previously authorized. We're, we got some studies to do um, some things that we haven't done in the past, like at Staten Island and some other places, to work forward. Um, but we still have this... Um, potential areas that are vulnerable and we all know that uh, the storms are occurring with greater intensity and um, more frequency than they have in the past so there is an urgency that we feel to get this done um, and uh, we still need to be uh, diligent and following up I think the biggest one of the biggest concerns is as we as we get we're 18 months away from Sandy it's good to hear these stories again and remember what happened because as you get um, farther away from the event, you tend to forget some of the uh, impacts and lose some momentum when it comes to the things that are necessary to get the projects to move forward. So hopefully with uh, communities like this, we can continue the awareness and meetings like this, we can uh, continue the awareness of these uh, and the importance of these projects and move forward. So that's my, uh, I think that's my presentation. I think I had one more picture here. This is the comprehensive study. I talked about that and uh, we are gonna be done with that in January 2015 and the team that's doing it has been working with local communities and continues to work with local communities and um, to, to understand and get a better feel for their their concerns so and then I, I talked briefly about the way ahead this is uh, in the Rockaways this is our project in the Rockaways that's what a pipe looks like after the sand comes out in a slurry mix and uh, the sand settles the water goes back into the ocean and um, we shape it with the dozers to make sure that it gets on there. Okay, I think uh, that's my time. I don't think I went over too much, but I, I, if there's a couple of questions, I can answer, I think, a couple of questions. Do I have time for a couple? Yeah. Okay, yeah, Great. Yeah. sir. Yeah, that's, that's part of the study. We'll have to look at that. And, you know, some people believe that uh, if you put a tide gate in, like under the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, the water's going to slam up against the tide gate and cause more damage at Staten Island and Rockaways. And uh, other people believe that um, the, the, the ocean is this infinite reservoir. So if you had a steady rise of surge, the water w would not. It would just go to a certain height. It's not going to necessarily increase volumes in other areas. Now, as you get wave action and the energy of the wave action, there's that's the other potential is for the water to, you know, bounce off the, the tide gate and do that. But that's part of the study. So again, that is that's a concern in a lot of ways. 
So, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, there are barrier islands, and technically there are also other barrier islands. So mm -hmm. is a barrier island, but that Long Island has barriers. So where, where, one is federal, one is Yeah. Not. So I guess I should clarify where there's a federal interest. And it's not federal lands, but where there's a federal interest is basically we do projects where uh, there's a federal interest. And that's based on a benefit cost ratio that's done with the local community. Um, so the local community will usually ask and say, look, we think there's a federal interest. We want you guys to consider putting either beach fill, a surge barrier, levees, whatever, and uh, do a study and determine whether or not there's a federal interest. So our, our team will go out as part of the study and do um, an economic survey, find all kinds of things. You can imagine a benefit cost ratio. You have uh, benefits on top, costs on the bottom. The costs are basically the costs of construction. The benefits are the structures that are protected uh, behind whatever project to do. So if that's greater than one, if the benefits are greater than the costs, then there's a potential federal interest. And the costs of building the project will be shared uh, between the local community and the, and the federal government. Does that answer your question? No? Yeah, I, I know that's, I don't know if, there's not a lot of federal land, so there, I mean, the, the Park Service is the, basically the owner of the federal lands along Long Island. Well, and, uh, is it like Alex and Lily Boys or ours? Well, it's, it's all of ours. It's certainly all of ours. We have certain authorities on the Hudson River. Everybody's got different, there's a lot of different organizations that have authorities. So for me, uh, it's a navigable waterway, so I have the authority. If anybody wants to build something, that, that touches the navigable waterway, they have to get a permit. So there's a lot of people that want to do stuff on the, the Hudson River, and um, they have to come to the Corps of Engineers for a permit. Let me go, go ahead here. Along with the, the bio program, uh, how, how does that work um, coastal infrastructure and transportation networks that are along those areas? The bio program. The buyout. Oh, the buyout, buyout program. program, okay, yeah. Okay, do you, just a quick, you have a question about that, or well, is there? Yeah. Well, well, there's good examples already. I mean, New Jersey is doing doing buyouts in certain certain floodplain areas on the Passaic River, and uh, you know, New York has done it in Staten Island and Oakwood Beach. There's been lots of buyouts that the state has sponsored to do to do there. And uh, when that happens, by the way, that changes our benefit cost ratio. We got to relook at things. So, but um, you know, generally, what happens is we we go to the local community. They, they do an engagement and start asking people who wants to volunteer for this program. And if you don't volunteer, um, you know, nobody's going to come and force you out of your home. But the, the fact on, on Long Island, that's going to be 100% federal cost. So it's a pretty good deal um, for someone to raise your home on Long Island. So um, we'll see what happens. But I'm sure we'll get some people that will take a buyout, some people that will want to raise their homes, and some people that will stay and you know, face, you know, have to have higher flood insurance, or if they're wiped out by the next storm, then, then we don't have to, then there's something that they had to so recover from. The, it, when someone, you take a buyout and you move the house, um, some of the ends of the streets are no longer used. And right. So for any infrastructure and transportation, how that's dealt with when that manage retreat or raise and left. Right. Yeah, that's, that's going to be, we're, we're going to talk to the state about that. And um, so there's lots of other concerns, too. Even with elevating homes, we have to deal with uh, local fire departments who may not have the necessary equipment. If you're going to raise your house eight feet, um, can, they, can the fire hose reach the, if in case you have a fire? So there's a lot of things that got to be worked out, which is part of the reason why we're a couple of years away from implementing our bio program um, should it get to that point. And again, even though we are fully federally authorized and federally appropriated dollars, uh, if the state or the city doesn't like what we're doing, then, then we won't do it. So let me go in the, sir, you, yeah. Um, like a special needs zone like the Brooklyn Navy Yard, mm -hmm. which is critical to job creation and the manufacture. I know it's the wood is flooded, but mm -hmm. you have some interest there, I guess. So yeah. I think, uh, I think if we put together a, a, there has never been a request for a storm risk reduction project for New York Harbor. 
But I, my guess is if one, we did, we would find a lot of very po a very positive benefit cost ratio for not just that area, but all the areas that would be protected by some structure. So, and you can do spot, again, you can do, do revetments and bulkheads and specific areas that are vulnerable and have a high benefit cost ratio area. And you know, that's the hundred little projects instead of the one big one, which I think honestly is right now we need to be pursuing those projects because we can't afford to wait 20, 10, 20 years for a big project and sustain the recurring damages. So, okay. Any other? Am I, I think that's okay. Hi. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was just uh, looking at the Native American side because on your website there might be a discussion of Stanford Professor about putting a field of um, uh, wind turbines in the uh, off the coast of Long Island and how that would just reduce the uh, wind energy and yeah. the Yeah, I, I saw that article too. It was it was interesting, and you know we're I'm all open for you know very innovative and uh, direct response. I think part of the article was the wind turbines could actually like run in reverse and push the waves back out, and uh, it could you know <laughs> basically it was it was maybe a little bit out there for that part, but um, we don't see that as part of any of our current current uh, federally authorized plans or or I don't. I think it may have been introduced to the comprehensive study team and they're taking a, a look at newer technologies that probably aren't in implementable in the next, you know, five to ten years or so, but we are certainly open to uh, any kind of ideas that, that could be uh, helpful in that, so. Okay. All right. Frank, thank, thank you, you for your time. And <laughs>